done his Borscht. And this is Grandmaster's Choice. We're actually going to talk about the reigning and current world champion, Ding Liren from China. So there is something that we got to clear up before we get into anything. There are some news circling around in the mass media, but truth be told, China already has a world champion. Xi Jun was the first uh, Chinese women's world champion, but they did not have the male world championship title as of today. And I mean, as of April 30th, we've got Ding Liran as the male world champion. And what is fascinating that he actually went through a long journey, including a time of the pandemic, which I want to talk a little bit about. So this lecture is going to showcase Ding Liran's style, which is somewhat mysterious. And you could actually see that in the reactions once he won the world championships. Uh, he wasn't as big of a favorite. He's not as well known. Even for the best of the best players, they are kind of mystified uh, by his talent. Now, Ding Liren is a little bit, a uh, bit on the artist side, so more in, interested in the arts, plus of course chess, but that's uh, nothing unusual if you are a top grandmaster. So what is fascinating is that through the pandemic's times, he played a candidate, a very infamous candidate, which actually got uh, cut in two parts where they had to play half of the event, the pandemic happened, and then they had to restart at another time. Now, interestingly enough, at the first half, he had an atrocious event, but at the second half, he had a magnificent candidates tournament. But by that time, he was so much lagging behind MVL and Apomniachi that he really never got a chance to catch up. And um, as nobody really paid attention, at least for me, it kind of caught my eye that um, even though the tournament was sort of basically over, he really never got a chance to recover and qualify to the World Championship match, which would have been the match that Napo played against Carlson. Um, he nevertheless mustered the energy to actually play and uh, play really, really well. So Ding actually is very well known, for me at least, for his fighting spirit. He's not as specially dazzling as of recent, but he used to be a very, very aggressive Kings Indian player, but that was before he became a super grandmaster. So that sort of is shrouded in mystery. Now, before we get into it, I wanted to have a couple of words about his love for arts and poetry. So he actually mentioned in one of his recent interviews that um, when he was down and was struggling in this World Championship match, he turned to the poetry of Albert Camus and um, read the lines, well, the lines of if nothing ever works for me, may as well try to fight as hard to survive the storm, and etc., etc., trying to weather uh, the storm and not actually just get depressed just because of the situation is being grim and not necessarily what he wanted it to be. But enough of that, let's get into some games. Let's start with this game between Dingler and Alexander Grischuk. Now, Grishuk is a very well-known player. Um, he's been in the candidates just like Peter Swidler. Uh, they've been in the candidates and have been there consistently. So, c4, e5, g3. And, um, well, if you've seen the World Championship match, it's no surprise. Ding actually opened with e4. Well, e4 he didn't do, but he did go knight f3, d4, and c4. So actually did play a lot of variety. C4, E5, G3. This one is actually trying to avoid 
very popular lines, and in general, the idea of bishop b4, which is trying to ruin the structure for white. In fact, this has been very topical even in the 80s when Karpov and Kasparov was battling these positions with e4. Oftentimes they would go knight d4 or sometimes knight e1. And this was actually a game between Kasparov and Karpov. So avoiding all these ideas, avoiding this bishop b4 pin, or semi-pin rather, uh, then goes for g3. And f6, bishop g2, bishop c5, d3. Now bishop c5 is a much more rare move. It's something I played early on and uh, with great success. The whole idea is if you ever go or want to go knight f3, that sort of runs into e4, and knight g5 still runs into tricks like bishop f2. So white actually has to make a couple of preparatory moves that otherwise wouldn't necessarily be that uh, useful. So goes d3, as I said, so in case of, let's say, castles, he can go knight f3 comfortably, because in case of e4, you capture and then you castle. And these are actually typical um, English positions where black may have sound position, but white is the one controlling all the important squares. So what you'll notice in Ding Liren's play, I mean, sometimes he dazzles you with tactical play overall, but sometimes he's just accumulating the smallest of advantages and tries to go from there. This is that type of position. So d5 takes, knight c3, knight b6, somewhat unusual. Most people were going knight f6, and this, I believe, was the original idea of Alexander Grischer. But a couple of words about Grischer. So yes, I talked about the fact that he's been in the candidates, but he was also pretty close to winning the knockout world championships. So we're used to the era where you play matches for the world championship title, but there was a FIDE segment where you had knockout world championships. And in those knockout world championships, he would go as far as the quarterfinals or even the semifinals, not going past that, past that but he would face players such as Vichy Anand, who is one of those champions who had won all formats of chess. So even though Vichy isn't heralded as one of the greatest, I believe that's a big mistake. Because if you think about it, Vichy was one of those few who won the knockout events, he won the round robin events, and won the classic world championships. So practically won everything that had world championships in it. Compare that to others, not many actually won the knockout events, which actually is somewhat harder and uh, much more roulette-like than the World Championship matches. Because you play one person over and over again, and either that person fits your style or it doesn't. Anyways, Grishchuk really is known for creative play. He really loves uh, playing something that's offbeat and something that is sort of his own brainchild. Here again, he comes up with the creative move of knight b6. And f3, knight c6, castles, castles, a3, and a5. Okay, so this position is somewhat different from the usual ones because the bishop is not on e7 but on c5. So if you're kind of new to the way I give my lectures, I always give opportunities either for questions, I'm always open for those, but also for you to try to guess the move or try to, you know, probe the positions that these really, really strong grandmasters are playing. So this is one of those moments where I do want to ask all of you, <clears throat> watching here live <coughs> and watching through the internet, what way would you play in this position? Now, a little bit of a guidance for your journey is that you still have this rook and bishop locked in, not doing too much. So trying to get them out might be an idea.
So any ideas and thoughts about uh, this position or the way you'd play as white? So what actually makes uh, so, like a little bit of an anecdote here while um, all of you are thinking of the position. I do know a very strong super grandmaster. Um, he's in his 20s and um, a budding player. One of the ways he actually became so strong that he tried to guess all these top players' moves. Basically guessing the moves. And that way he kind of found an affinity of uh, how the top players and top guys play chess. And talking about uh, Ding, what was actually kind of heartwarming and fascinating that Xi Jun, the women's world champion of China, actually showed up to support uh, Ding Liren in the very last round, which is kind of a support that you don't always see. Um, in these matches. So bishop e3 is an interesting idea. The only downside of going bishop to e3 is that you are voluntarily ruining your own structure. Not that bishop e3 is necessarily bad, but why create a weakness when you don't have to? Bishop d2? And what is your idea? Mm -hmm. Just getting the pieces in. Okay. Any thoughts? What do you play as white? If not, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Knight e4 makes a lot of sense. You want to chase the bishop and then go bishop e3. Now, it didn't happen, but that's definitely a typical idea in these type of positions. You go here, and oftentimes you even go bishop c5. The biggest issue um, in these positions as black, that oftentimes white goes bishop to c5, and if this, of course, this trade is a big blunder by black, but in that case, this is a big advantage for white. This is like the strategical plan when you're playing on the white side of the English. If your knight could land on c5, that would be marvelous. So one of the ways of playing is, of course, knight e4. Bishop d2 is a move you can play, but it feels a little too timid, or at least for right now. And the other move that is actually kind of popular is going bishop g5 provoking some weaknesses. I mean, if you go back, you lose time. If you move your queen, well, your queen is not ideal here. And if you move this pawn, then this diagonal becomes really weak. Now, actually, Ding chooses a different option. And let's be very clear here. Ding is probably out of his preparation, while Grishchuk is obviously prepared. So any of the moves that seems very logical, knight e4, bishop g5, etc., or even bishop d2, is very likely is in Grishchuk's notes. So when Ding decides to go knight to a4, it also is trying to throw off Grishchuk and just meet him on a fair ground. So there's a little bit of uh, psychology going on, and not necessarily trying to find the best move, because they might just find themselves one-on-one -on -one with an engine, because of a home preparation. So take sticks, knight d4. Now knight d4, even though not at all a bad move, may not be that great. You could also just go rook to e8 over defend the e pawn, move the bishop away. Because knight d4 actually creates a problem for black. Can any of you guess what could be sort of the issue with this knight move? What could be the problem with this? What could be the downside? That's what I'm trying to say. And it, you, you shouldn't really be thinking that there's something horribly wrong with it. Obviously, it's a legitimate move in the position, but it does sort of loosen uh, Black's grip. 
But what way? You guys think. How does it loosen the grip? The pawn is not defended. And also this bishop on g2 becomes much, much stronger. When there's a couple of pieces in front on c6 or d5, that bishop is sort of stifled by those pieces. When you go knight d4, you're basically voluntarily opening up this uh, white squared bishop, which is sort of the crown jewel of white's play. Of course, you can't quite take on e5 because there's knight takes e2 check. So takes, bishop takes. Okay. Now this next move, what uh, actually Ding plays, is something I really, really like because it thinks about not his own plan, but about black's best pieces. So he's more interested in just outdoing Grishchuk with better piece placement than just being busy following his own plan. He's just going to sabotage Grishchuk as much as possible. So your goal should be to look around and say, hmm, does black have a good piece? How can I reduce the damage done by that piece. Now obviously those rooks don't do too much. You're not too scared of those. we are mostly scared of this bishop on d4, right? It's sitting, it's, it's on the throne on d4, and it's in a central square. So here, he goes bishop d2, but now he goes e3, as planned. And the whole idea is to kick out the bishop. Now if you take here, it would get trapped, because there's no way out. If you go here, I just capture you. And there's no way back, of course. And even if you take here, I can take on b2, and I defend my bishop over there. So all, this, all white is doing is restricting this bishop. Bishop b6. So Black was hoping to have all these trades and say, well, my position is no longer bad. And probably with every trade, he actually exposed more weaknesses. The weakness on a5 and the weakness on e5. So both of those pawns are actually a little bit on the loose end. So it goes bishop c3. And he actually could try to take on d3. But Grishchuk is sort of uh, conservative and says, well, I don't think I'm much worse. Why would I take this pawn? But he definitely could have taken the pawn. And then the position is more or less dynamically equal. But he goes rook e8. And that isn't necessarily that great. OK. So a next strategical problem we have is deciding which rook goes where. And that is what I want to uh, see and figure out. Where should we put our rooks? So oftentimes we look at games which are, which are very tactical. And hopefully we'll have the time and chance to do so. But this one is more of a strategic game. And here, what really matters is your piece positioning. If you find the right squares, you may actually get a chance to pressure your opponent. You misplace them, you're going to be under pressure. Rook a d1, and where would the other rook go? Uh, d1. Okay, and what is the. So you go here, here, and what is this rook going to do? Uh, I'm going to do what? I'm going to push the pawn and uh, open. Which pawn? Uh, the B, B okay. Yeah. All right. So here, here. Okay. Is there any other formation we could use? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Playing for all these bricks. Very good. So the issue with this one in here, you sort of have to anticipate of the consequences of your pawn breaks. Whenever you go rook a d1, rook f e1, d4, and let's say you trade, well, first off, you will get kind of a bad pawn, but if you don't, like let's say you go here, you're just making a couple of moves. If you take this way, this pawn is weak. You actually manage to get an open five for a rook, but at too much of a cost. The pawn is uh, isolated. You take this way, which would make much more sense, right? Because you keep it intact and you got the formation still. But then what is this rook on e1 doing, right? We don't quite know what it's doing there. Um, so really, you bring your rooks where they are going to be useful later on. So you'd rather bring this rook and go d4 because you sort of anticipate the opening of the default, right? So in that sense, even keeping your rook here is better. So if the A file ever opens up, your rook is going to be useful. The only issue right now is, anytime we go queen c2, because if we go b4, there's always this capture, and we can't really capture back with the pawn, which we wish to, uh, because of the rook. But anytime you'd move the queen, I can not push my pawn. So I will basically stop you from ever playing b2 to b4. But anyways, let's continue. So rook d1, bishop d7, rook c1. He's sort of realizing he's not going to be able to go b4 because of all these ideas from back. So rook c1, h6. Okay. So we managed to find good spots for our rooks. But the question is if there's anything left that we could sort of strengthen in our position before we go for a break. Now also be careful, d4 still isn't that great because of some tricks. So we don't want to fall for that just yet, or at all, to be honest. Okay, the queen could get a better position. So what would you consider? Where would you post it? Good. Okay, so the best way of thinking of chess is you sort of look at a group of ideas or a candidate's moves, if that's familiar. Um, you could think of queen c2, but I wouldn't really stop here. I'd say, okay, that's one way of improving the position. But is there any other different ways of improving, which is not necessarily a queen move? So sometimes you can actually uh, copycat your opponent. They are actually giving away ideas. Every move, I mean, as long as you reach a high enough level, they have a purpose. So black actually purposefully uh, pushed this pawn. You can do the same, right? And the whole point would be, in that case, is that no back rank ideas anymore and also I'm sort of restricting your bishop. Now the question becomes are you going to go here or are you going to move the queen here or maybe you're thinking of a third option because it's also about uh, comparing these two you know just like buying an apple you check them we check them which one's better quality. Same thing here. Mm. 
Which one contains a bit more risk? Yeah, and if here, then they can go A4, right? That is one of the issues. It goes H3. Um, and these are the sort of moves that just go completely unnoticed for someone who's unaware of how strategic chess works. They're building. They're slowly moving forward, but then you have to build it up well to it actually work well enough. Um, H3, and this doesn't look so sparkling. And this is something that is a bit Petrosian-like. Um, the reason I'm mentioning Iron Tigran over here is because he loved to play chess like this, incremental chess, where you're building your position and you're not necessarily giving away the direction of your play. Rook b8, and rook b8 I do not like, and rook b8 kind of shows that Grishuk has no idea what he's going to do. He doesn't want to move the bishop because he thinks that the bishop is better here, doesn't want to move this bishop because it has some tricks on the queen, doesn't move, want to move anything else because then these, like then these guys are a little bit loose. So there are some times when your opponent has the move, but they wish they could just pass. If they move the king, then the pawn becomes weak. So even though white is by no means winning or anything like that, it's black who's sort of struggling for choice. And rook b8 doesn't really strike me like a great move. For the reason it only defends the pawn, but I mean, you do move away from the a pawn. Okay. So do we still remember our original goal as white? Chat and everyone here live watching. What was our original plan in this position? D4. Yeah, breaking with d4. So we still kind of run into the idea of this, and that is kind of sad. But how can we prepare this idea? Well, no, I mean, you do, do make a good point that the B4 break is better than it was before. But that wasn't really our original plan, right? We wanted the d4 break. And that's actually pretty important. Once you decide and embark on one plan, try to stick with it because it actually helps you improve your chess. Because if you bounce around too much, you don't necessarily know what you're aiming for. So for that reason, it goes rook d2. He's actually going to prepare d4. You could also argue queen c2, as we talked about. Um, but he feels no need to move this. By the way, white would be super happy to see c5, because then this bishop becomes a monster again. It doesn't necessarily mean this is terrible of a move, but it does give some good strategical chances for white. Grishu goes bishop c7. And now he goes d4. Notice that uh, these strategic waiting moves sort of uh, unbalance Grishchuk. They don't seem that earth shattering, yet they're pretty strong. Here, d4. Take, c5, queen c2, takes, takes, c4. Now, a lot of things have changed. Now, Grishchuk doesn't take here. Because white can take here, and white has immense amount of pressure on black's position for free. So Grishchuk goes for c4. c4 is a very interesting idea, and an ambitious one. But Ding sort of notices 
what Grishchuk wants. What do you guys think? What is Grishchuk planning to do? Yeah, they want to rule with B5, B4, actually. So not really A4. They're trying to play for their majority. So they go for B5. That's the idea. And once you realize what the opponent wants, of course, you want to do the opposite, or at least sabotage it. Yeah, ding goes a4. If you push the b-pawn, that doesn't really stop anything. Black can still go b5, and that actually gives black a decent position. a4 is very nice, because if you go b5, I'm capturing, and your structure is in shambles. And I can just push the pawn, and it's just the quality of thesis. I've got a magnificent bishop, in fact bishops, and your bishops are subpar. That bishop on b5 is just staring at the pawn on c4, and these pieces aren't that much good. So it goes bishop d6 instead. Now, Ding realizing that his position has changed a bunch, now he has a d4 pawn, this rook on d2 doesn't really do too much. So he goes rook d, d1. And that is somewhat of a shocking move. Why would you go rook d2, put pressure on the d file, then just go back and just turn around? Well, Ding just decides the situation has changed. I need to control the e file. I already have an extra... Uh, pawn here that I can use later on in the game. So b6, rook e1, rook takes, rook takes, queen c7, pawn h4, gaining a little bit of space. Now, and this is not really readily known information about chess, but of course you want to get control in the middle, but if you could also expand on the sides, that's how you slowly uh, win the game. H4 is also trying to cram down black. Rook e8, bishop d5. Not just attacking this pawn, but centralizing the bishop. And also winking at that pawn on f7. Takes, bishop takes, bishop e6. And this is actually the critical moment. Or ding. Whether to capture, or if we do, how are we going to follow up? If you just look at this position briefly, you have this feeling that there's not much happening. However, Grishuk's position is slowly uh, actually falling to pieces. Okay, so what is black going to do after queen e4? Uh, he passes the bishop and captures. Okay, and then what are you planning to do after? So we're talking about queen to e4, takes, queen takes. It's a good stability square. It is a good square, but what are we going to do once we got the square? Okay, I probably will move my king. So here, takes. Probably I move my bishop. You check, I move. Welcome, go go. So as I said before, 
we're trying to create more targets. We're trying to create more problems for Grishchuk in this position. At least Ding is trying to. Mm-hmm. So, um, we uh, isolate the pawn. And by the way, you can mix ideas. So I'm not necessarily saying what makes chess difficult. When I said queen e4 might not be the most precise, it doesn't make the move bad. It means it may not work here. But sometimes it's sort of a combination of the two, or two different ideas, and you connect them. So take first and then bishop e4? And then queen e4, yes. So that's sort of the whole point. If we go here, it takes, we stand pretty, but we don't actually have like a clear way of winning or finding a way to break through. Because black has. Grishuk built kind of a very, very solid position. I mean, he's a great player. So we actually have to create more targets in his camp. So taking here is very important because now there's two pawn weaknesses and the king is awfully um, breezy over there. So queen e4, king f7. <clears throat> and now but white goes bishop to c3. And I really like the way Ding plays. There's just a lot of aim for harmony. Bishop c3 isn't the most staggering move, but if we come back in this position, the queen and the bishop aren't really doing that much. We are putting pressure on c4, but they're sort of lingering on the board. And in a couple of moves, both of these pieces are improved to the max. So a position which didn't seem as um, promising is almost near decisive, and in fact, Grishchuk is collapsing soon. d5, and the issue is, not only am I pressuring on the long diag, you still have plenty of weaknesses, including your king and the pawn on c4. So queen d6, takes, check, king g8. Bishop d4. Small move, but the whole point is to over defend the f2 square and hit the b6 pawn. And also taking away any sort of tricks. Queen f5. King h2. Look that he's still not hurrying at all. He just made sure that the bishop can't move away. That would be a problem, by the way, because. Um, if that bishop could be traded off, the queen endings are usually drawn, regardless if you're up a pawn or not. And by the way, of course, you can't ever go here because all of your pawns would just fall. And this is what I was saying. Million moves ago, those pawns were defended, but now they're weaknesses because there's nobody left to defend them. So king h2. Queen c2, check, queen f7. Again, just keeping the control completely. And now black is just near lost. Queen d3, bishop c3, queen d6. Unfortunately for black, you can defend both the bishop. I mean, if you move it, it's mate. And you can defend the c pawn and the f8 bishop at the same time. So it's just collapsing. Queen d6. Queen takes e4, queen d6, bishop d4, and here Grishchuk just resigned because all is he going to see is white going queen c3, queen e3, pick up all those pawns, and it's game over. So, what are our first impressions of this game of Ding Liran? How would you describe this stylistically? Very subtle. Very subtle, right? There are a couple of tactics, but not, not really the core, right? It's, it happens sometimes, but it's very strategic. Slow moving, 
Petrosianesque. And I mean, here I refer obviously to Iron Tigran, uh, Tigran Vartanovic, the Armenian world champion. So just this slow, subtle, grinding play. And not um, and Grishchuk seemingly barely made any mistakes, right? Not not like oh a blunder here or a pawn falling there. It was just that he got squeezed off the board. Mostly, I would actually fault the fact that he started trading, because it made it easier for White to come closer to those weaknesses on e5 and a5. I believe that was sort of the culprit why um, Grishchuk's position fell. But talking about a game that is amazing is the game between Bai Jinshi and Ding Liren. And this game, what unbeknownst to me, is actually Ding's favorite. So even though you've seen a classical strategic brilliancy in the previous game, you're going to see what was the young and upcoming Ding Liren. So D4, C4. This is a classical Nimzo Indian, very popular. Castles. So here there's plenty of moves. There's pawn C5, there's pawn D5, which would actually transpose to the Ragozin. But Dingleran chooses castles. Bishop G5, C5, E3, C takes, and Queen takes D4. Now, you may not be familiar with all the details of this position. You may still notice that this queen takes d4 move might be somewhat suspicious, right? We think about it. What makes this move somewhat subpar? It helps you develop the knight with tempo. But what actually is going to come to light while well, we figure out this game is that this not just loses time for the queen it actually does not help white's development white actually does not spend enough time to put his king into safety like the main line is pawn captures and eventually white will castle but here they ain't going to let that slide. Here, h6, very, very cunning little move, winning time on the bishop, and also creating a loft for the king. So in general, I am always on the side of playing this move because it's such a multi-purpose um, one with plenty of ideas. So bishop h4. And the next move here by Ding Liren is very logical. Um, yet still very strong. d5. Your opponent's king is in the middle. You should strike in the center. So Ding Liren, even though um, very, very aggressive in this game, he still uses the basic principles of chess. Rook d1. Okay, so now here comes the big question. How can we inch closer to this king? And we may actually have to use some drastic measures. Now, you may notice that we're kind of pinned all around the board, right? Pinned all around. Now, we need to untangle first to be able to be aggressive in this case. Queen f5 makes sense, however, our position is probably going to collapse after a capture and pawn capture. It's not going to work out in our favor. Yep, g5 indeed. So a very, very risky move. You are weakening your structure. But Ding, I think, does play, apart from being someone who's very good at calculating, 
he does understand the strategy of this game quite deeply. Like, okay, yes, I actually make my king vulnerable, but your king is going to get exposed. And as it's said correctly in chat, that will allow him to pop the knight to e4. Knight d2. Well, here knight capture isn't really that good because black can't always go back with the bishop and on pin, and white doesn't really have enough material and pieces around the king to checkmate. So here, knight e4, knight d2. So do we trade? Or do we avoid that idea of trading? Of course, we don't trade. Because when you're on the attack, anytime you trade, you make life easier for your opponent. You don't want that. If they manage to castle, you are going to be in big, big trouble. Because the king is going to be extremely weak. And if anyone's going to play for a win, it's not going to be black. So goes knight c5, queen c2. d4, opening it all up. Of course, you can't take here, because I go knight d4, and I'm actually opening it all up for me. So Baijinshi goes knight f3, banking on the fact that our queen is pinned. So the next sequence of moves by Ding is quite astonishing. But very logical. And I think that's something that you can't uh, forget. Anytime he's going for something very sharp, he still follows the principles. So if you're talking about principles, is there still some pieces for black that are not participating? What? Which piece is not participating? Mm -hmm. And therefore e5, right? So see how it easy, easy it is? You realize some of your pieces don't do too much. Nothing is as logical as going e5 right now, so this bishop can be involved in the game. Knight takes e5, and here comes the shocker. Bam! D takes c3. Gives up the queen. Says, I'm going to get only light pieces and a rook, but that's going to be enough because your king is in the middle, and I'm not really scared of that. Takes CB, King E2. Rook D2 probably was better, but it's, it's still very sound. But King E2 is reasonable. He believes that nothing wrong can happen here. Rook takes D8, Queen takes B2. Now, this is the moment we've got to be very, very, very aggressive. Because if we're not, we're just lost. Yeah, we're just too, too many materials down. We're just too be much behind here. So our goal will be to launch our attack. Our goal will be to launch the attack here. In case of bishop f5, I will capture this knight. You can check me, but I will try to run away. Bishop f5, I take, and I take your bishop. And you run out of pieces very quickly. So we kind of realize in these positions that time is of essence, right? 
meaning mostly you'd like to play moves that either check the opponent or attack something very valuable. So they don't really have time to react or play something of worth that would help the bishop on f1 and the rook on h1. Like a bot. Yes. Just go on here. And what's our destination? Yeah, you want to go to c3, yeah? yeah? Now, rook d2 wouldn't really work because they just capture everything. We run out of pieces and the attack dies down. So here, check here. And now here comes Ding's most spectacular move. This move is probably among the recent brilliancies of our chess. Now, of course, he isn't as beloved as many other players, but this one definitely deserves the highest of the high praise. And it just shows uh, how creative Ding can get if he's given the opportunity. H5, you are sort of hitting at the right idea. H5, probably I'm going to go H3. G4? G4 I do capture. Okay. So your move has to have a goal. And it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're threatening checkmate. Boom. Rook D4. Quite an elegant move. You can't touch this because fork. And you definitely can't touch this because this is mate. So black forcing white to go h3, but now we continue on. We go h5. Well, if you go there, well, that's still mate. Quite beautiful. Bishop h2, g4, king g3. So let's see. How can we chase this king around still? Mm -hmm. Actually, he doesn't even go there. He goes rook d2 first. So he notices this idea, but he's again uh, using the fact that in this case I have knight e4. And you just lose the queen. Queen b3. Now he goes knight e4. Check. Takes. And, you know, whenever you're playing a brilliancy, you know that you're creating something for eternity. So your heart is pumping. You're like, oh my goodness. This is going to be epic. But look at Ding's next move. King g7. Cool, calm, and collected. All he wants is to get the rook over. That's all he wants. Nothing else. And it's mate, actually. If it gets there, it's mate. So bishop f4, bishop f5. Just, just chilling. If you go here, go here. And if it takes, of course, this is just mate. Not much you can do about it. So goes queen takes b7. Rook takes f2. And again, just setting up this simple mate in one. So takes mate. You got all of your pieces still in the garage. And there's not much you can do there. Bishop g5. Rook h8. Setting up this idea. You take mate. So takes on f7, bishop g6, takes on g4. And uh, this next move by Ding is basically the coupe la grasse. 
which is a beautiful move and just wins in stop. This is probably the nicest ending move. It's not made yet, but this next move is the beginning of the end. I'd like to move and win. Now, of course, you gotta roll with the attack, otherwise, you are definitely behind. Bishop f5, I move my king. I will block it with my bishop. But just a disclaimer, this move is equally as spectacular as was the previous 5-6 moves. Uh, will capture knight? Well, that's a fine move, but it doesn't really threaten checkmate. This next move is threatening. Is actually forced checkmate. The sequence of forced moves and its mate. Check. Resigns. Why? Because if you take here, check, here, check, here, mate. So, what makes this game fantastic is how Ding used all the strategic principles just to finish up the game with a furry flurry of attack. And they couldn't really stop it at all because it was strategically sound at the same time. So, I really hope all of you enjoyed these games. I hope you kind of saw that Ding's game is actually very universal, even though he prefers to play slow strategic chess, he is very much capable, since childhood, to play masterpieces such as this one. So, thank you so much for coming and thank you for listening.